Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines. Death toll rises in Gaza as Israel announces expansion of attacks. Hundreds gather for annual march for disappeared persons in Mexico. Mine workers enter sixth week of strike for fair wages and safe conditions. And in our video section, we take a look at the COVID-19 situation in India and declining vaccine supplies. In our first story, at least 28 Palestinians have been killed so far as Israel continues its airstrikes on Gaza on May 11th. Among those killed are at least nine children. Three leaders of the Al-Quds brigades have also been killed. Palestinian media have reported that nearly 160 persons have been injured so far. Israeli airstrikes targeted several locations of Palestinian res resistance groups in northern, western and the southern regions of Gaza Strip. Residential buildings in the Al-Shati camp and the Tel Al-Hawa and Al-Rimal neighborhoods were also hit. Several structures used by Hamas as well as agricultural lands and industrial facilities have been targeted. The Palestinian Health Ministry stated on Tuesday that over 788 injuries had been reported since Monday evening. Over 631 Palestinians were injured in occupied East Jerusalem alone, with 411 cases of hospitalization. Protests had broken out across the occupied territories and within Israel following the violent raid by forces on the Al-Aqsa Mosque on Monday. Over 330 Palestinians were left injured as forces fired stun grenades, tear gas and rubber-coated bullets. Residents of the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood were also arrested and assaulted. At least one Arab citizen of Israel was killed and others, another seriously wounded after a Jewish man fired at a demonstration in the city of Lod. Israeli forces then raided the Al-Aqsa compound for a second time on Monday night. A fire was also reported in the mosque compound as hundreds of Israeli settlers cheered outside. Palestinian group Hamas had warned Israel to withdraw its troops from the mosque compound in Sheikh Jarrah by 6 p.m. Since then, Israel has reported 300 rocket attacks from the Gaza Strip. Two Israelis have been killed in rocket fire on the city of Ashkelon. In our next story, we go to Mexico where hundreds gathered for the annual protests on May 10th. While the day is internationally celebrated as Mother's Day, it has acquired a different significance for parents in Mexico. It is now marked as a day of protest to demand justice for those who have gone missing. Estimates suggest that over 86,000 people have disappeared since the start of Mexico's drug war in 2006. According to the EFE news agency, more than half of these cases have been reported since 2018. Over 500 people participated in the 10th annual March for National Dignity in Mexico City. The march was organized by the Movement for Our Disappeared in Mexico, which is a group of at least 74 collectives. The MDMN collective has also placed certain demands. These include the implementation of proper search protocol, forensic identification mechanisms and federal programs for affected families. The collective has estimated that there are over 50,000 unidentified bodies in the country. Parents and relatives marched from the, uh, from the engine of independence to the monument to the revolution on Monday. Mothers had also held a protest march and launched a 7th international caravan in search of missing persons. Protesters have also urged the president to veto new reforms concerning the Attorney General and the law on disappearance. They have argued that the reforms will roll back the rights and guarantees for the family of victims. In our next story, we go to the US where nearly 1,100 mine workers have entered their sixth week of strike. Organized by the United Mine Workers Union, workers of Warrior Met Coal Facility in Alabama went on strike on April 1st. This was after the company presented a contract that would have cut down wages, health care and other protection. Workers are demanding that their wages be restored to what they were before the pay cuts in 2016. At that time, the mine's previous owner, Walter Energy, had filed for bankruptcy. The union had agreed to a $6 per hour wage cut for the mine workers. Workers have stated that their wages have yet to increase despite record profits and huge bonuses for executives. They are also demanding safe working conditions and adequate health care coverage. As per reports, they are made to work mandatory 12-hour shifts, 6 days, 6 or even 7 days a week. As the strike action disrupted Warrior Met's operations, the company offered a tentative agreement early in April. It offered a $1 per hour pay increase with another increase of 50 cents in 3 years. While this offer was accepted by the United Mine Workers Union, the mine workers themselves rejected it with a vote of 1,006 to 45. As reported by Truthout, the tentative agreement also did not do away with the company's four-strike policy. This means that workers are unable to take time off due to unexpected leave or injury, uh, events or injuries. As reported by the World Socialist, Warrior Met has used drones and hired private security guards to surveil the striking workers. The company has also brought in hundreds of strike-breaking workers. Other intimidation tactics included the patrolling of the picket by state police and private security. The company also filed an injunction order to allow just six workers on the picket line at any time. And in our final story, we take a look at the current COVID-19 situation in India. The country recorded over 329,000 new cases in the last 24 hours as of 8 a.m. Tuesday morning. While the total number of active cases declined, 3,876 deaths have been officially recorded in one day. The country is also witnessing a decline in vaccinations, especially in rural areas. According to a report by the Indian Express, 37 surge districts have reported a drop in jabs by over 50%. Here is Dr. Sumitra to talk about his experience on the front lines against the pandemic. 
what has happened in the last four days, there is a reduction in the number. Three, four days is a reduction in the number in the, in the casualty or the emergency room, as we call it. So, but before that, it was, it was beyond uh, absolutely out of control, the number of patients coming in. There, uh, we have 30 beds in the ER. I'll just take you through this, 30 beds in the ER. We, at, any, at any point of time, we had 100 patients almost. There are patients sitting on chairs getting oxygen because there was no space to make them lie down. There was no physical space to put a stretcher. There are families, sometimes we had to ask the families who were with them, like one attendant was allowed. They, we had to ask them to step out because there was, there was no space to breathe in the ER. It was that bad. He had no place in the wards or in the ICU for lots of patients. So there were lots of people who could not get a bed in the ICU, could not get a bed in the ward. So they, some of, and we did not want to turn them away, but we did turn some of the patients away who came in ambulances, which were good quality ambulances, which could take them to the next hospital. We also received a lots of patients who had been all around the city trying to get to a hospital and had died on the way. They had died in the ambulance. Uh, so there were lots of patient, people who were like that, unfortunately. Uh, there were patients who had died, who died in our emergency room because, as I said, we had no space in the hospital wards. In the, we tried to do the best we could in the ER. I mean, no space means no space. We had extended our facilities by 40% more beds. We put beds wherever we could. And in the ICU, we have trolleys between beds. There is no physical, even now, there is no physical space in my ICU to walk between beds almost. So the quality of care obviously cannot be the same level as it would be in a normal circumstance uh, in the ICU. Having said that, the timeline of COVID is such that patients who get hospitalized or are at home with oxygen, a certain percentage will deteriorate. That's why even in the best healthcare systems, patients of COVID die because of that. We in increased our number of ventilators. We bought ventilators as fast as we could. Uh, we rented them, we have reached 50 ventilators, but we will need even more ventilators soon because patients, will, as I said, deteriorate in the next few weeks. That's mm -hmm. how COVID uh, goes, I mean, a certain percentage. So that's, that's the situation we have. It is uh, difficult, uh, is, uh, is a very mild word, I would say. Mm -hmm. It is really, really beyond difficult. Having said that, I would like to say something else. The poor in this country have to a certain extent faced this even before COVID. Yeah. It has been triaging for them. I have trained in a public hospital, in a public medical college in the 80s and 90s. And even later, we have seen the poor lie in the emergency two to three to a bed in government hospitals because they have no access to private hospitals. They are triaged to which patient you can accommodate in the ICU because there is always more patients than beds, than ventilators. So many of the residents and nurses uh, are web very, uh, I mean, they almost uh, are uh, being affected to the point that they, they feel that we could have done better uh, if we had the resources, if we didn't have such patient load. They have seen young people die because of lack of resources, dying in the ER. There have been resident doctors and nurses who have called me up just to say, we have no complaints, sir. We just want to cry because they have seen us do a very good job in the previous surge. And they know that we could save a lot of people, even in the ICU, even on the ventilators. We, our outcomes were as good as the Western world, as good. I'm not trying to brag, but it was as good as the Western world. We keep, keep uh, you know, working on the evidence, looking at the evidence, looking at uh, our clinical outcomes, et cetera. It was as good as anywhere else. And this time, obviously, the outcomes are bad because as, as not as, as good because we could not provide ventilators to those who needed them. We could not provide ICU beds to those who needed them. Obviously, the outcome is going, not going to be good. And that's what they lament uh, that, you know, we know that we could have done better, sir, if there were these. And, and that, that, that is going to affect them for a long, long time. And they are younger. They are starting off their careers in many ways. And uh, for them, it's a difficult thing. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.